Hi everyone, my name is Megan Pormer. I'm a scientist in biomedical engineering, a fashion model, and an actress. I know it sounds like I wear a lot of hats, but I'm most excited about my newest hat, your host on The Megan Pormer Show. Hello, my loves. Welcome to another day on The Megan Pormer Show. Today, we're going on another emotional roller coaster. Actually, this is gonna make you feel really hyped because I am here with the founder of The Hype House. Now, to those of you that have been living under a rock and don't know about The Hype House, Hype House is one of the biggest content houses in the world. They started in 2019 with a handful group of influencers and TikTokers. And guess what? The house created some of the biggest TikTokers in the world. Welcome, Thomas and Mia. Thank you so much for coming on my show. Yeah, of course. Well, Thomas, I want you to tell me about your journey on how you started. You started with Team 10. Yeah, I was, so I was affiliated with Team 10. I was never a part of it. That was a common misconception with people. But I was friends with Jake and I saw what he did and I saw what worked and what didn't work about uh -huh. Team 10 and I saw the huge potential of content houses. Um, but I went out, I went about it with a very different approach. Um, so I brought people in, but instead of creating a company and signing talent and taking a percentage and blowing them up or whatever it was, um, I decided to just bring a group of friends together and we kept the business part out of it so that people were free to come and go as they please. Wait, are you telling me that it didn't financially benefit you to create no. these stars? <laughs> no. Well, I, I bet you, you're not gonna do this again. It, no, <laughs> it, it was a good decision because it kept the friendships uh, as real as they could be at the time and it, it was just an amazing opportunity. It also helped me grow my brand as well as my personal so brand. So you were really focused on the friendship and yeah. not so much of the business aspect yeah, of it. Yeah, because when you have good friendships, the best content comes out of it. And that was wow. what I learned. Because if people are obligated to be somewhere, they're not going to be themselves or they're not going to be as happy to be there. And so we kept it as everyone just have fun and it was, it was an amazing experience. How long have you guys been dating? A year and a half. A year yeah. and a half. Yeah. So you, when you started the Hype House, you guys were not together yet, right? No, she she was friends with Alex, and like they all made content together oh. for uh, over a year before okay. I even was affiliated with them. Um, and then we moved her up like six months into the Hype House, and okay. then we started dating. So you called up a bunch of close friends. You said, <laughs> let's start a house together. Let's yeah. live together and make money together. Yeah, well okay. Alex and I, had, I'd been talking with Alex about this idea I'd had for years before it ever actually happened. Mm -hmm. And I called him and Cobra up and I was like, hey, send me money for a, the deposit we have to put down and we're moving into a house. And so they broke their lease, they moved up to LA, they just joined and it was just, we were all, we didn't have, even have a name yet. It was just, we want to all live together. Oh wow, and then little by little yeah, you guys started grew. collaborating. Yeah. Okay, so what was the most challenging part of starting a content house? I think the I underestimated how difficult running a business would be on top of, because not only do I have my own brand that I work on and my own YouTube content and TikTok content and all of that, I also have to spend the rest of my time working on the Hype House and I have to deal with I've had to deal with five lawsuits this year. I've had to pay all those bills. I've had to do, deal with everything myself that I wasn't expecting to pay for or do any mm -hmm. of that. I was expecting all the fun times right, right, and not right, the right. serious times. So I, I thought that was the most, that was what caught me off guard the most. Was it worth it? Oh, 100%, yeah. Okay. And so, living with other people as a couple, <laughs> I wanna know what, how you feel about that. I mean, it's interesting. He's obviously everyone's very close, uh -huh. but I know a lot of people do like to seek advice from him. Right. And so sometimes it was a little hard at first, like adapting to that because right. everyone always wants to talk to him, but sometimes I just want to be left alone in the room, but right. then there's like five people in the room. And that was mostly at the first house and the second house. It was always like 50 people knocking a day and we had a ring. And so I was like, there's just always people that need something from yeah, him, yeah, and yeah, so. Yeah, I get it. And you're in the middle of a very intimate moment with him, and they're like, <laughs> Thomas, I need you! This, right? this last house was the best that it was, because everyone has their own space, Alex and Cobra do, and all the guys do, Got and it. so it was a lot 
better at this house okay. because everyone was just respectful of one another. So, so uh, all couples fight. So when you guys want to fight, do you <laughs> get, do you fight in front of others or do you specifically go to one room and like mm, one room? No. <laughs> okay, so no fighting in front of others. No. Do they fight in front of you? Uh, one of them. <laughs> oh yeah. And how, what about the boys? Because I imagine like like boys in their oh, early they fight a lot. They look, like go at each mm-hmm. other like and they punch each other in the face. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then how do they patch it up? They, they just, just hug each other yeah, after the and they're like haha I love you. And I'm like oh, But was okay. there a time when you guys thought that they mu- it might be past the point of No, not with them. Yeah. They all they fought so many times. It's like it's normal. <laughs> Did you ever set up rules that okay, oh. we even if we fight we're going to sleep Oh, not next to each other, but like, <laughs> like, 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 we're gonna patch things up by the evening. I always left it up to them to deal with, which they didn't like, because a lot of the people thought they could just <laughs> argue with each other and get no backlash because Thomas would protect them. And I was like, oh no, it's on you guys. So okay. that kind of terrified them. So you, they wanted you to play the big daddy. <laughs> oh oh yeah, like, they, they thought I could no, protect them. No, no, okay. So now, some of the inf- uh, influencers or TikTokers that were not living in the house, yeah. Like Addison Ray and Charlie D'Amelio. Of uh, how was that to deal with people that were not actually in the house? Well, when I first met, I, I first reached out to Charlie when she had probably five, ten thousand followers on Instagram. Addison had maybe three or four when I first reached out, and they were growing fast. But I knew that they were going to do really well, and they it, w- it was a mutual trade off. It was they came in, they helped blow the hype house up, and in return. Become, becoming associated with this group gave a certain notoriety to these people. And like even one of my close friends, Larry, has talked about this. He was already huge before the Hype House, but he came in and it put him in this like A-list category mm-hmm. and more people began paying attention to him even though he was already famous. So right, it, right. it helped build a certain brand reputation for those creators and they also helped grow the brand itself. So they were able to bring in their audience to it, and we were able to bring our audience to them, and it grew all together. It was amazing. And um, when did Addison leave? Addison, Charlie, and Dixie all left around the same time, and it was never like a "oh, we're leaving." It's yeah, a, yeah. It, it was just a their brands got so big and that they being associated with something that could get, say, we could get sued, or say we could get that they they would be involved in those problems. Got it. And it didn't make sense for their teams to be involved in something that could hurt their career. So they were at the point where they were so successful that they were able to move forward. And that was the whole point, was to bring talent in and push them out better, if if that was possible. Right, right. So we were able to bring people in, everyone grew together, and then went off to do their own thing. And it was like, that was the whole point. We weren't trying to keep people for five, ten years. There There was no reason for that. It was, as long as you feel like being a part of it, be a part of it, and when you're ready to move on, Move on. There's nothing wrong with that. So how did you even find Allison and Charlie when they had only a few thousand followers? It was all TikTok at that time was very apparent who was going to be the next people. Got it. And I was able to see that. And I think there was something about being a part of what we had that made everyone as big as they were. Got it. Because I noticed that everyone involved with Hype House and Sway House at the time became who was popular on the app. And everyone else kind of faded unless they stayed consistent over the last two years. Got it but it was able to help bring people to a, a different level. Now, I'm gonna ask a c- confidential question that's gonna stay between us and all the millions of people <laughs> that are watching us. Nobody else. If you dig deep, 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 very deep in your heart, are you slightly regretting not owning a piece of Addison Ray when you discovered no, her? <laughs> no, no, that, that I've never regretted for a minute. That I never wanted to be God, you're too enlightened for me. I can't handle this. I I never wanted to make money off of something that I felt like could ruin the friendship at some point, Mm -hmm. and I just kept it like that. Okay. And I've never regretted that. I think that was the best decision I made, and what made Hype House bigger than every other content collective was that. I want you to tell me, as a TikToker, how can you turn it into a business and make money? I think that that was my main goal with the Hype House, was getting the same notoriety that uh, a s- normal celebrity would get, which is brands and all these opportunities that come from being famous. And I was able to relay that to brands when we had people like Charlie, Dixie, Chase, at, like all these people a part of it. I was like, look at the numbers that they're getting. Mm-hmm. Why are you paying someone who gets a million likes 
from being on a Netflix show, mm -hmm. millions of dollars. But you don't view someone with getting a million likes on TikTok or Instagram. They don't view it as the same mm -hmm. because they're just influencers. But at some point, that bridge has to happen. Mm -hmm. And when the paparazzi is taking videos of us at Saddle and it's getting millions of views and they're following Justin Bieber and it's getting 12,000 views, it's like you at some point have to realize that that, that attention is going to move and it's going to go from celebrities to then maybe musicians to then maybe TikTokers and then maybe YouTubers again and then maybe but look at the Paul brothers they're A-list celebrities okay. even if you want to call them YouTubers or not they are A-list celebrities and it's if you're willing to view them as that and pay them as they should then that, that was what I was able to relay to the brands and was able to make a lot of the people a lot of money is because why why is Addison not a celebrity? She is. Mm -hmm. She has 40 million followers. She is mm -hmm. a celebrity. She's on Netflix now. It's like that reputation is what took so long to build. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the Hype House had that was able to bring that to the people that were a part of it. It's now time to take you guys to my part of the world. We're going to Abu Dhabi for VidCon. We're going for the biggest social media event of the year, which is gonna be on December 3rd in Abu Dhabi. You guys, have, have you ever been to the Middle East? No. Okay, I wanna know about uh, all your emotions about I'm, this trip. I'm extremely excited. Um, we recently just took a trip to Europe uh, with an awesome company, Maven's List, uh, and we're super stoked to be able to come to Abu Dhabi. I've never been, I've never seen anything in the Middle East, so I'm super excited. I expect a very wonderful, crazy event. Now, uh, these guys have a message for you in Abu Dhabi, and we're gonna come back with that message. Ana Hakun, Bitcoin Abu Dhabi. Love, Love you. about your involvement with this incredible organization that focuses on rare genetic diseases for children? Well, uh, Columbus Children's Foundation is really um, somewhat of a startup foundation. Our mission is to accelerate cures for kids with ultra rare diseases and we work on programs that pharmaceutical companies simply can't justify investing in because there's too few kids in the world. And so we use a nonprofit approach to step in and develop these cures. Gene therapy is the, is the uh, technology that we use. Uh, we develop the cures and accelerate them so that we can get as many kids treated as quickly as possible because, uh, because time equals life for many of these children. Since uh, these genetic diseases are very rare, how do you find the individuals that are going through the pain? It's a great question, and interestingly, they find us. Um, there's so much uh, need in the market uh, for what we do and the, the role that we play in stepping in with this ultra-rare space. And so we typically partner with uh, patient foundations that are generally started by a parent um, who has a child who were uh, diagnosed with a rare disease, and they, they're not going to take no for an answer, and they're going to go out there and they're going to find a cure for their child. So we work with one program uh, called SPG50, and, and uh, Terry Pirovalekis uh, started this Cure SPG50 Foundation. And you'll see uh, here at the venue, there's a little uh, uh, poster of Michael. And, and Terry, uh, he said, it's not okay for my child to fall apart and I am going to become a citizen scientist so that I can find the cure for my child. So he worked hard to create, you know, to work with some uh, 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 scientists and researchers and they got the basic science figured out and then we work with them, uh, programs like that to accelerate them into the clinic, which is really where the cures are delivered to the children. Laura, I want you to talk to the audience and tell them how they can get involved and how they can help. Well, I appreciate that because you're exactly right. I mean, this is all about kids, and we're not talking about developing treatments over tens of twenties of years. We're talking about actually delivering treatments to kids today. So it's not far away science. It's science that is curing children today. So um, our website is www.columbuschildren.org. We have uh, social media. Uh, we have a hashtag, share your rare. We're doing this wonderful event here at the Sunset Marquee, which has a hashtag of 
ultra rare jam. And our foundation also believes that music is a great way of bringing people together uh, to rally around some of the biggest causes uh, in humani out there that humanity needs to solve. So having these artists and this talent coming together on behalf of our organization, but actually on behalf of these children is really special. And so music is such a great uh, tool to bring to people together to do great things. What is your emotional connection to this cause? Well, I will say this, you know, anytime music and philanthropy come together, it's a good thing. But in particular, these are rare diseases, you know, where, you know, a hundred children have these rare diseases. It's in, in big pharmaceutical companies, they're not going to put the research in because they're a for-profit business. And the fact that we could raise money to help kids survive and, you know, live a full life and flourish, you know, is, 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 is a no-brainer, you know. And it's, and it's something that, that, that's really, you know, the people around the organization are very passionate about. I have long-standing ties to this hotel, and I, I met Mark and, and all the fine folks at the, at the, you know, Columbus Children's Fund, and that was, like, you know, I was like, well, this is going to be great, and if we can raise a lot of money and put on a concert and have some fun with, with my, our friends, um, I mean, everybody wins. As a parent, how do you feel emotionally connected to this cause for all the parents out there that have a child with a rare genetic disease? Well, I mean, uh, being, uh, being a parent and having a healthy son, uh, you know, I, I do uh, really appreciate and understand how valuable and what a blessing it is to have a healthy child. So um, I have a lot of, uh, you know, compassion and, and understand that, uh, well, I actually couldn't possibly understand the, you know, the the heartache and, and the trauma and the, the changes that a parent would go through when they have a child that has a, you know, a very a serious disease. So um, it's, it's difficult to understand, but I certainly have compassion for it. And, I, and I've always tried to instill, especially in our son, uh, over the years, you know, we've made many trips to St. Jude and to Denver Children's Hospital and, um, you know, to try to make him appreciate the fact that he, he was born a healthy child. And um, it's really, uh, I'm sure, you know, uh, just one of the the, one of the very fortunate things for us as parents. So um, it's just something that I've, I've I've tried to contribute uh, when I can to uh, you know to charities such as Columbus and, and other things like that. So um, yeah, so it's um, hopefully we'll just uh, we we'll play our music and do our part, and uh, hopefully we can do some good. Imagine as a parent uh, finding out that your child has a rare genetic disease that is not something that you can find cure for easily. What is your message to all the parents out there that are in that situation? They have their kid that is trapped in this pain body. Uh, at first thought, to me, it is. it seems as though that as a parent that you're in a powerless situation. But I believe that is the point in time that you exude as much, as much power as you can to try to help the powerless and you know don't quit like it's never over it's never over so if there is a fight in the life of your kid then that should double the fight inside of me as a parent to have you know to stick 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 it out and be there through thick and thin with them now we're at the historical sunset marquee hotel if the walls could talk what would they say about you and this hotel have you spent a lot of time here well, if the walls could talk in terms of me personally, yes. We've been here over 25 years. In fact, uh, our son was just a little infant swimming around in that pool, uh, and he grew up here. Um, and they've thrown birthday parties for him, and um, it's really a family kind of thing. So uh, we, we love it here. We love the people here. They're very, uh, they're great. Um, obviously, you know, the, the clientele is always exciting and, and cool that uh, so many musicians and actors and, uh, you know, people in the arts, uh, you know, love to come to the Sunset Marquee. And I understand why, because, uh, you know, everyone feels comfortable here. Uh, years ago, I decided that uh, I didn't necessarily want to be a part of the all the hoopla and the uh, business of Hollywood because it's really just a distraction for you you know and uh, 
I don't want to spend my life, uh, you know, trying to schmooze or impress people or whatever it is. I mean, not that I ever did. I really didn't. But now it's uh, I only go the places where I know uh, uh, they're safe. I kind of try to stay out of the public eye and just do my work. So I. I keep turning out uh, music and movies and uh, hanging out with the family and recording in the studio and touring with the band. And that's, outside of that, I just don't get involved much with the other stuff. Uh, I was at the, you know, when I get an award nomination, I go because it's sort of, you know, your duty to the project. But other than that, uh, you, you know, I kind of stay away from the red carpet. You helped. Angelina find who she is. How do you feel that she created a superstar? First of all, she created her, herself and, and recreated herself over and over because she always had that thing. The great thing about our relationship was that we were always best friends. And that was the number one thing. And to this day, she's one of my very best friends. But she is not only talented, but she is a great human being and has done so much for so many people. And she sacrificed a lot when she didn't have to. Artistically and creatively, she always knew who she was. Uh, I think we opened each other up, actually. I think she gave me what I needed, and I think I gave her what she needed at the time. And we continue to. We still do. Every conversation we have, we both learn something that the other needed to learn. So uh, it's, uh, it, it keeps going. And uh, I'll always love her as a human being. How did you manage to go from an emotional, painful divorce from Angelina to being best friends? There was never really any break in it. We both knew that it was time to move on, and we just did. And uh, we knew why. You know, you miss people and all that, but we knew that we would never go away truly. So, yeah, there's pain, but then, uh, you know, once you're past the initial part of missing someone uh, on a daily basis, that's when the friendship really takes its roots. It's almost like it never happened. It's like we're the friends that we were when we first met. What's your message for them to go through this tough times and help their children? and that ray of hope they need to know that they can get out of it. Well, I would just say to parents that children need you so much because you're the place where they feel safe. And uh, no matter where you are, and no matter even if you're a product of uh, divorce or if a parent passes away or whatever it is, the, whatever parent is there, uh, needs to give them 100% every day because we brought them into this world. And uh, so no, no matter what your situation is, whether you're together, apart, uh, single parent, uh, perfectly happy uh, and together, whatever your situation is, the main thing is, is always let the child know that no matter what else happens, you never leave them, that you're there. Because they are your responsibility because you're the one who brought them here. That bond should never be broken. And, you know, children need to feel safe. That's the most important thing. So I guess that's my main message. Make your children feel safe. So what is your beautiful message for people that are watching you? What would you like them to know about you, about the foundation, about how they can be of service yeah. to their people? So this, this organization is definitely here uh, to speak for those that really can't speak for themselves. And I come from Memphis, which is the home of St. Jude. So, you know, that hospital I grew up around, and there's a lot of, pe a lot of young kids who can't speak for themselves. And they can't say when they're in pain. They can't say when it hurts, you know, but they're still there fighting. And uh, it needs to be people there that let them know that we're here to fight for them. Uh, emotionally, physically, monetarily, everything that can come uh, possibly in to help these kids have a chance enough to at least see junior high school, to see high school, prom, you know, those type of things, let alone flourish into a long longevity of life. So if this is a way to help try to come up with medicine to combat, combat the evil diseases that are out there that doctors are 
dumbfounded as to the cure or dumbfounded to a, a treatment, if this can be a way to help, if by me playing a couple of songs to help people donate money, then I do it all year long. Welcome to another day on the Megan Former Show. You call it a talk show, I call it an adventure. They said I would never be anything. I defied all my odds. I crossed the ocean. I chased my dream. I am the most durable here. I'm the most resilient. You know, they told me that I had a drug overdose. But, you know, to be um, perfectly honest with you, I didn't do drugs that night. The loss of your child, mm -hmm. the loss of your mother. I know God brought me back, but my family's prayers and all that, I know brought me back as well. Kobe was really in, um, insightful. Was he? And, and thoughtful in everything he, everything he did. I had everything I wanted as far as the woman is concerned. Would you get back, back with her? Oh, no. I mean, yeah, I would. I really got into a really dark place when I realized, wow, my life's going to be different for the rest of my life. You know, I'm, I may never walk again. Oh, oh God. <laughs> How much is it weigh, Adam? Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and today we're going to have the Hollywood Burger Challenge. Okay. We're going to have four of these influencers compete in what they think is the tastiest burger. Oh my God, I actually feel so chic. I think this has your name on it. I don't believe in having that type of victim mentality where I'm gonna sit around the 32, are you gonna cry? <laughs> no, it's, it's just, um, I'm sorry. I had a very loving relationship with my father. I grew up like my father was my best friend, but I, um, I lost him in an accident about 10 years ago and it created this strange type of abandonment in a sense mm -hmm. in me that the person that I love is gonna die. Jennifer Aniston. Brownie. Hey, honey, he's not bad to look at, you know, but we are so long gone. We are buddies, we are friends. Every time we're together, we'll smile, laugh, cry, dance, joke, explore, and the list goes on. Three, two, one. Is it up? I have a confession I have to make. Oh. Um, we like confessions. Keep okay, going. Cool. So the confession is... Uh, we all have our struggles. Some are just more visible than others. Mm -hmm. Don't feel that you have to be something by a certain age. You know, I was doing a minimum wage job in my 50s. I want you to get over your fears and go after your dreams. No matter your race, your color, your age, your situation, how many kids you have, you only have one life to live. Let me tell you one thing. The worst thing in the world is to have a dream die with you. So happy International Women's Day.